Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. You could say that today's message, uh, we're, we're, I've entitled it Healing Bridges. You might consider it being Repairing Bridges. Um, you could say that today's topic is really uh, what birthed this series, Building Bridges. Um, I, let me give you a, a, just an opening story to help explain what I mean. Uh, I was at Caesar Rodney High School not too long ago, and they invite um, different religions to come in and share in the world religions class. And I always ask for honest feedback on Christianity. And I always ask the students in high school, you know, what's your perspective of Christianity? And I always get some pretty interesting um, views back, some, some good, and then, you know, quite a few negative. And, but there was this one girl that spoke up, and it really broke my heart because, and I'm just jumping right in, as you can see. Um, but... I want, I, I, I'm hoping that this today really helps us to be careful how we speak and what we say and what we process with people. But her mom uh, told her that if she doesn't get water baptized, she'll go to hell. And that if she doesn't go to church, she'll go to hell. And I immediately just felt bad for her because you saw her face and it's like she, she believes God's real. She believes in heaven and hell. You can tell because it burdened her. But um, she said that, you know, she, she would say that, and then she would tell me how to live, but then I would watch her live a different way in the house. Like she would go to church, and, and you know, she would tell me about, you know, what, what it means to be a Christian, and then when she came home, she just lived a different life. And so it really hurt her view of God. It really hurt her. She had a fear of God in, a, in an unhealthy way. It wasn't like a, a fear of worship and all, you know, and, you know, let me be holy because he's a holy God. It was more of like God's going to strike me dead if I don't do something for him. And so I took uh, a good chunk of that class to teach the Bible. So I'm in world religions class in Caesar Rodney High School teaching the Bible. All right. That was kind of cool, right? And it made me, uh, this, this really, that, that moment and many moments with uh, people in the community, whether it's at a coffee shop, whether it's even people who come into church, I truly believe that God has called us as believers to at times reframe or heal or repair misconceptions of Christianity. So if, there, if this is where I'm headed today, okay, this is where we're headed because Dorothy's story you're going to hear soon. I want to lay out, you know, a foundation for a scriptural foundation and everything. But Dorothy's going to share her story where she had the opportunity to help fix some, some bad thinking and some, and it wasn't necessarily their fault either. And so let's, uh, let's be careful. Let's be careful of, of what we say to our children, our neighbors, our coworkers, and that we represent uh, God as best as we can. You know, we're not perfect. I told her that your mom's not perfect. Maybe your mom doesn't understand scripture um, and doesn't understand that water baptism doesn't save you. Jesus saves you first. Water baptism comes after your faith in Christ, okay? So I explained that to her as well. But as you build bridges in the community, as you build relationships, you're going to run into some people, and I want you to be prepared for them. Uh, you're going to run into some people who have, have a negative view of Christianity, the church, God, for a variety of reasons, some of them could be church hurt. Some of them could be because we, we Christians, we take strong stances uh, for what we value most, and we don't have to apologize for that. You know, we, we are for things, but unfortunately, a lot of people look at us and go, you're always against everything. Well, we're really for things too, right? We're for life. We're for uh, Christianity. We're for Jesus. We're for eternal life. We're for a lot of things. And so sometimes they take that and look at it wrong. Um, there could also be the mistreatment at times. Christians were not perfect. So, you know, we get called judgmental a lot, all right? And sometimes that may be true. And then sometimes it's just a misunderstanding that uh, to judge actually is a biblical uh, perspective. Within the church, we're allowed to judge someone by their fruit. If we're concerned about a brother or sister in Christ, we're actually allowed to go to them and say, hey, I'm a little concerned. All those things, that's actually biblical teaching in the Bible. 
But when we're outside the circle, you know, when we as Christians are, are getting on people who are not even Christians, you know, that comes across judgmental because they wouldn't even know how to live a Christian life. You know, so, and we'll get into that. So you have these different situations where people can have this wrong view of Christianity. And so what can we do? You know, what can we do to help rebuild and repair? I love these scripture verses, and it's in Colossians chapter 4, 5 through 6. And I want to, uh, you'll, you'll have them on the screen as well. And I want to read two versions, the NIV and the NLT, because I like how they both read. And it says this, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Let your conversation be gracious or full of grace, sorry. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Season with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. And then look at the NLT version. It says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. It's good, right? It's very good. Yeah. Very good. So in a nutshell, we are to be wise around those who are non-Christians, those who are outside the church is what this is trying to say. We need to be careful and wise. We seize every opportunity we can. In other versions of the Bible, it says to buy back the time to redeem time. So it's to purchase up that time to use that. The days are evil. The days are evil. So use this time wisely. Uh, Ephesians 5, uh, Paul says it in a different way. He says um, to make the most of opportunity, every opportunity because the days are evil. Okay. Uh, that was then. It's still evil. Right. And so we need to utilize the time we have. And make the most of every opportunity. Church, can I just be real with you, though, and honest? I think sometimes we miss those good opportunities. And you know what? It's just part of our spiritual growth. It's part of being in tune with the Holy Spirit, you know, being ready at all times to share the hope and the faith that we have to answer, you know. And, um, I mean, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit I've missed some great opportunities. I, I missed it. I learned something from Henry Blackaby. He said, he said that we jump into, we're supposed to get into whatever God's already doing in our community. In other words, God's already working. His job isn't to come to where you are to work. Your job is to go to where he is and work. So he's already working. He's already moving in your community, your neighborhood, and your job, your workplace, your family and friends. And so he... He's saying, look for where God is already working and jump into that current and get ready to serve and help. And I, I love that. It's always been, it's always stuck out to me. Around non-Christians, our speech and conduct is important. To be gracious and attractive, okay, I want to make sure I clarify something here. To be attractive doesn't mean <laughs> to say something that they would want to hear. Okay, there, there's this thing where, you know, if we attract people, then they'll listen to us. And, you know, that doesn't always actually work. I don't think that's always healthy. Um, to be attractive isn't, isn't to compromise our convictions of what we believe. Okay? Oh, you know what? If I, if I laugh at that perverted joke that, that my coworker just said, then maybe they'll listen to me. And I've talked to the youth about that, you know, in high school. Hey, don't jump into the jokes and don't jump into... The, the inappropriate talks and, and laughing. Don't, you don't have to laugh with something that someone said that's wrong just to be attractive and look like you connect and like you're, you're normal. No, you don't have to do that. What it means is, is it simply means to answer or speak with gentleness and respect. It means to just not turn someone off from the Christian faith, not to sound dead. You know, salt, he uses the word salt here in the scripture. Who likes, uh, who likes to eat eggs with no salt? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Anyone had a burger with no salt on it? Oh, that's rough. It just, you just need a pinch of salt, you know what I mean? Why? I mean, is there anything else I could think of? I don't know. Is there anything else? It's bad. 
Um, my wife and I, we were eating some dinner last night that we made, and I guess we forgot to put enough salt in it. Or in compared to the other meal that the other people made, it was like not as salty. And she was like, I think I need to add more salt to this. I was like, yeah, I think we do. Um, but she did a great, great job on the meal. I'm not trying to cut her down on that. <laughs> this is recorded, isn't it? Yeah. We'll, cut, we'll cut that We'll cut that out. piece out. We'll cut that out. Uh, Salt brings flavor, yeah. right? Salt brings flavor. He's saying here, talk in such a way that your faith is actually something you're excited about. Right. Something that's awesome. You know, have conversations with people where you're passionate about God. Where you're not, you know, I'm going to church today. <laughs> I go to Calvary, you know, yeah. You know, God is good. God is, God is good. God is good. God is good. No, no, I mean, come on, you know, like, you get excited about what God's doing in your life. People want to know. People want to know what you're all about. And so he's saying, you know, that's, that's the kind of conduct and speech we should have. Um, I love what William Barclay says when it comes to, uh, you know, being careful how we talk with people. He says, few people, and this is turning to a different uh, thing because we can get into arguments with people. He says, few people have ever been argued into Christianity. That's good. Few people have ever been argued into Christianity. Now, I, I agree. I love what's called apologetics. It's the defense of the faith. It, at times, there's debates you can see online. Ravi Zacharias and many others are really famous for these. But they always do it with gentleness and respect. Mm -hmm. They always do it with salt and with, and with grace. And they're always respectful to every question. They'll get some off-the-wall questions. But they'll say, thank you for that a great question. It's a great question. They don't go, that's a stupid question, you know. They don't do that. And so, and, and, but I love what he's saying here. Few people ever get argued into Christianity. And he says this, the Christian, therefore, must remember that it is not so much by his words as by his life that he will attract people or repel them from Christianity. On the Christian, there is laid the great responsibility of showing men and women Christ in his daily life life. Now, you've heard of this quote from Gandhi. He says, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Hmm, that one hurts. Now, that's not all of us, but he's just saying, let's be, you know, you're, we're supposed, and that's the thing, that's a misunderstanding. The mis, uh, misconception and misunderstanding is is that Christians have arrived and we're already like Jesus. And we're not. And that's something I had to explain to that girl at CR and many other kids. Like, I just got to be honest with you. The church is not perfect. There's a reason why we're followers of Christ. We're not Christ. And we're working. We're in progress. Amen? But there's times where we do the damage and we shouldn't. And, uh, and I want to say this real quick, too. Even if we do everything right... Even if we do everything right. Remember, Jesus was still crucified and he was perfect. The reality is, is not everyone's going to believe in Jesus. I've been wanting to say this for a long time. Because I realized that we could, we could do everything right. We could build bridges all day. We could connect with someone. We could say all the right things. But there's going to be a time where some people are just not going to agree with us or believe in Jesus Christ. They're not going to. This is what scripture says in Matthew 7, 13 through 14. It says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. So they enter through the, the large, broad gate of destruction, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Unfortunately, church, that's the reality for our world. Doesn't mean that we stop too early, right? Doesn't mean we quit early. But before that scripture, Jesus says something pretty radical. And I want to make sure I explain this so you don't take me wrong. He says, Matthew 7, 6, it says this. This is, this is kind of, this is, wow. This is a bold statement. Yeah. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. I, I see we have the wrong scripture up there. It's okay. Matthew 7, 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. 
Wow. What is that? Well, Jesus was saying there's some times where throwing out the truth of, of Jesus, throwing out the truth of the kingdom is like throwing pearls into a pig pen. They don't care. They don't care. It, that, what is a pearl to a pig? This is going to get muddy and dirty. They're going to trample on it. And there are some times where there's going to be people who actually not only trample on it, but they're going to turn around and insult you for being a Christian. More on that next week. But the reality is there are people where you have to literally, what Jesus says, dust off the feet, off your feet, dust, dust off your hands, you know, and continue forward and move to the next town. And so I want to put that out there just to let you guys know that there will be times where that may come up. Now, again, am I telling you to call people pigs? No. Am I saying rush to that conclusion? No. no. But I have talked to people at times where it didn't matter what I said. They were already insulting me. They were already insulting Jesus. They were using his name in vain. They didn't want to talk to me. And I said, it's okay. Hey. And you know what I do? People ask me, what do you do when that happens? I walk away and I plead the blood of Jesus and his mercy on their lives. Right. Right. I don't insult them back. I say, Lord, help them. God, open their eyes to see whatever hurt them in the past, whatever misconception they have, destroy it and teach them. Send someone else. I plan to seed, send someone else. But the reality is that seed seems like it never even stuck. It just bounced right off. So you just pray God's mercy upon them. So, but with that said, before we jump into her story, to Dorothy's story, may we never find ourselves intentionally lighting bridges on fire. May we never, this is what, when I read that scripture, that's what I think of. Be, be so proactive in, in being attractive and gracious with your speech and your conduct. Be so wise on how you act that it's not you that lit the bridge on fire. It's not me. It may be someone else. It may be the other person. Let us not be found doing that. Amen? Dorothy, share your story of what happened because I, when we heard it, I mean, when, I, when you shared it with the team, it was just, it really struck us a lot. And, you know, obviously this is difficult, you know, because this is personal. And so Dorothy is being pretty vulnerable here about this story. And um, we mean no ill when we say this story. We love everyone in it. And, um, but it's going to get a little real here. Okay. And, yeah. So, go If ahead. I may, too, before I yeah. start. Um, I am nobody special, and I, I value the opportunity to be able to share this story. Um, I've missed opportunities, like Pastor Ryan has said, um, so I don't want to make it sound as if for a minute that I have it all together, um, but I do look for those opportunities, and I pray for God's discernment. But one of the things that I want to say is that through the course of my life, I had to learn what it looked like to live in the grace of God. Okay, because you can grow up legalistically and feel that you have to do all the right do's and all the right don'ts, okay? Like, you know, you can't go to dances. Yeah, I grew up in that age, sorry. <laughs> I'm aging myself, all right? You know, you can't go to dances. You can't wear certain things. and Can't and play with playing cards. Like, you can't play with, can't like. can't go to movies and yeah. stuff. Yeah, so I a, grew up in that age. Like a okay? deck of cards, oh, all that stuff. Really? Is that, I, yeah. I played with so Did I guess you? I was a sinner. <gasps> you were a sinner. <laughs> I said, oh my please forgive me, Lord God. Because yeah. no, it, anyway. it represented gambling yeah, and poker. But you know. I grew up in that kind of framework, okay? And so I had to learn what it meant to live in the grace of God and apply it to my own life, all right? Because I believe that a lot of people, if they don't have the right view of God and feel that God is judging them, that's what gets translated to the people that they talk to. All right, and suddenly we want to judge everything outward about them, and that's not who God is. Now, I'm going to try to, I'm going to read this because I don't want to miss pieces of this story because I took time to write it down, okay? But um, this past summer, I had the opportunity to hang out with my nieces and nephews on a vacation. Uh, so we were there for an extended period of time. And one evening after dinner, I think it was the last night before we were getting ready to leave, we're just hanging around a table outside on the deck, and it was a beautiful night, et cetera. And they were all drinking, all right? Uh, not heavy, but definitely consuming alcohol. 
And they all know how much I hate alcohol because of my own upbringing and my own personal convictions. Now, I say that because my father was an alcoholic, okay? And I saw his hurt. I saw his pain with unforgiveness, which drove him to hide his pain behind alcohol. I've had one-on-one -on -one conversation with my kids my, and some of my nieces and nephews regarding drinking. They're all young adults mostly now. I never had that conversation out of judgment, but more from a why standpoint. Like I would ask them, why do you want to drink? Why do you need to drink? And of course, the dangers of alcoholism and the, and the addictions in our own family that run in, that, in our family that way. And that evening, these uh, young adults were very comfortable with my sitting there around that table as they all started sharing different stories of their lives without hesitation. Now, I'm a question asker, so I would prod them with questions, not, again, trying, I just was asking more questions for more details. I was trying to dig deeper into the details of what they were sharing, and they kept sharing. At one point, my oldest nephew asked me if I was all right, <laughs> <laughs> based on what he was talking about, what I was hearing. I said, hey, it's fine. I've heard a lot of things in my lifetime. There's not too much that can rattle me anymore and that's the truth in ministry we hear a lot of things so you know that wasn't something that really turned me off and I just love the fact that they felt that they could be real while I was sitting there in that way so he asked me how I was doing I'm like I'm good and so they kept talking and I kept listening I had the chance to interject here and there about um, ways that they could uh, value their life experiences or get more out of their life experiences uh, we all grew up in Christian and in Christian homes and Christian heritage. They understood why I said the things that I was saying as I interjected. I, I didn't take over the conversation. I didn't preach. I didn't judge. I didn't attack what they were talking about. Uh, they, they would have shut down if I had started doing that. And I just wanted to hear them talk because it gave me insight into what was going on in their lives and to be able to hear um, things like, uh, their hurt, uh, hear things about pain, um, their disappointments, their betrayals, their grief, their loneliness, their trauma, their unforgiveness. And I'm serious, that was all wrapped up in that conversation that night. So I did not want to shut that down. And I asked, I'm sitting there praying in the spirit, honest, like, Lord, please, right now, give me discernment through your spirit to say things if I need to say things and keep my mouth shut if I need to keep my mouth shut and just listen. And, and God was there. And just to say, that is a really good thing to do. Yeah. Because there's often times where I realize that the situation I'm in is greater than my own abilities. And I need to stop and ask God to help me. I want to say something, too, about the, the whole situation. You were uncomfortable because of your past and everything. And uh, the, big, the biggest concern for you is, is drunkenness, you know, as the scripture says, not to get drunk. And what's interesting, though, is they actually might even be uncomfortable with you there because you're, yeah. you're the only one not drinking, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like you're, you are kind of like the outsider to them. Right. Right? Yeah. And you feel like you are outside because you're different in that area and you want to stay abstinent because of your past and everything. So what's happening right there is they're letting you in yeah. too, mm -hmm. which is interesting. So there's this bridge taking place being built right there in this one yeah, conversation. Yeah, just be present. Mm -hmm. Just sit in the circle. Like yeah. Last night, just sit around the fire pit. Just sit there. Yeah. Just get into just be the there. circle, yeah. you know. As we learned last week, just be present. That's right. In their lives and, just be and present. look for a way to connect. Yeah. yeah. So you, you stopped and you prayed. Sorry, I interrupted yeah, you. Yeah, no, but that's okay. okay. No, I was asking the Lord for discernment. And those are the things I was hearing as I was reading between the lines in the conversation. Now, during our time together also on that trip, I was able to talk to my oldest nephew about his relationship with his grandfather, who is a believer. He's my uncle. Uh, he was open, my nephew was, and indicated that when he talked to his grandfather, they would start to go um, past the surface to deeper things, um, and then the question would be asked, are you going to church? And of course, for my nephew, the answer was no at the time, which led to correction, my uncle, or my uncle, my, his grandfather correcting him, and pretty much it was shut down the conversation because he wasn't doing right in that way. 
Um, my nephew experienced so much trauma um, in the, his military career as an army ranger. He saw friends killed. He suffered a traumatic brain injury resulting in a battle with depression and he's wanted to and tried to harm himself on numerous occasions. God, I, we just pray the blessing you know, covering over him all the time for God's protection on him. Uh, he lost his grandfather, my aunt, uh, to cancer. She was his confidant. She was his, like, almost like you could almost call him, her his best friend, and he lost her to cancer. So there was a lot of grief there. So there was a lot of things that were below the surface that they could have talked about, but instead it jumped to, are you going to church? which shut down the conversation, and I felt sad about that. So we were having a conversation, you know, and I said, I'm sorry about that, you know. I wish that your relationship with your grandfather was better, you know, because it is so much more than just going to church. So you, you look for that opportunity to, to insert that. He had had a conversation with me several years ago during dinner on another vacation where he was talking about the fact that he didn't want anything to do with religion because of what he had seen overseas in the military because everybody was killing in the name of God. And he's like, you know, if that's what it is, I don't want nothing to do with it. Everybody believes that what their way is and how they're doing things is the right way. And I don't want anything to do with it because it all doesn't look right to me. It's all wrong, he was saying. Um, and so it opened the door for me at that point in that dinner to validate his take on it. I get it. I get why you would come to that conclusion. Like Ryan said, he validated what that young lady felt in CR High School. He validated what she was feeling instead of just jumping right in to correct her thought process. And then it allowed me to share that it, it, this is not what Jesus intended. He didn't intend for killing in the name of God. That's not what he came for. And, and then... I went on to say that Jesus came to heal, to restore, to have a relationship with us that's full of life, peace, and joy, um, and that he didn't fight when he was here. I even used that story, you know, I didn't, came, didn't come to draw the sword, you know, I came, he came to serve, and what a difference that makes. So my heart hurts for my kids, my heart hurts for my nieces and nephews, they're young adults, and I love them a lot, and I don't want to be that person who only looks at the outward and doesn't see the heart. Um, my, they've got tattoos and everything like that, you know, and instead of me looking at that and saying, why do you have a tattoo? You know, it takes up too much of your arm. What the, you know, how's that going to work when you go to work? You know, all that kind of stuff. It's like I look at it as a conversation starter. Hey, that's cool. Why did you get that tattoo? What does that mean to you? Hey, if you're going to put that on your body, there's probably a good reason why they decided to do that, you know? And so it was always conversation starters for me. I call them evangelism pickup lines. You know? <laughs> Sorry. That's funny. Yeah. yeah that's funny. Hey, you, you, should write, you should write a book on that. Make the most of every opportunity, yeah. right, brother? Sure. All yeah. right. So. They do work, actually. I know Sam has mentioned that he uses yeah. his tattoos to, mm -hmm. to connect with people, so it's cool. <laughs> So my cunt, my cunt, my son called me several weeks after that vacation, and he just says, Mom, I just want to thank you for being who you are. Mm -hmm. And he says that you were able to sit there during that night when everyone was drinking and listening to all those stories, and you didn't judge. Mm -hmm. You just sat there and you listened, you know. And he says, I'm really proud of you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, cool. thanks, bud. I yeah. appreciate that. Um, and, and to me, I'm only doing what Jesus would do. Yeah. Um, Jesus doesn't attack the actions. He doesn't judge the sinner's choices. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes for the root of the matter, our need for life, his life, his forgiveness, his peace, his reconciliation. It's his love yes. that will win them. That's right. The reality of a better life, a true gut fulfillment. That's what life in Christ is all about. True life fulfillment. Not the temporary fulfillment that comes from sexual exploits, drinking, trying to fill a hole that only Christ can fill. And I pray for these kids, and I pray for our kids, and I pray for teenagers and you today um, that Christ will be able to show himself to you. And when the opp opportunity presents itself, I'll always interject the truth of Christ with these guys 
my, my family. Um, even in cards I send, yes, I still send birthday cards and stuff like that to, to them. Um, and even in the cards, I'm always reiterating their value and how God sees them and sharing a, a special message to them in those opportunities. So, you know, always remind them about how much God loves them. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Hey, uh, while you're at it, just go ahead and share with the church your another story with the copier guy yeah. on a different kind of, um, it wasn't such a, like an uncomfortable yeah, moment thing, for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I always look for opportunities because I work at the church, all right? There's not too many times that I've got people coming in here that need Christ, but we do operate with a lot of vendors. Yeah. So I'm always looking for opportunities to share Christ with the people that are coming into the house, okay? So we have a copier guy that was coming in, and um, he's training us and teaching us things, et cetera. And in the process, I just asked him, hey, how, you know, he, he services a lot of churches. How have your other experiences been in your other churches with training people and things like that? He says, you guys are great. This has been a great opportunity to be able to be here at Calvary. You guys just listen. You're having a lot of fun. You looks like you love what you do. And I'm like, yeah, we do. <laughs> we do. You're catching this on a good day. No, I'm just <laughs> you're kidding. Fine. You're fine. Uh, uh, yeah, we love what we do. You know, I, I said, um, and, and he's, he mentioned the fact that, you know, he, he has seen things in churches where there was a lot of disagreement over where things should be, how things should operate, and that kind of stuff. And he had witnessed that even in his business. And I just had the opportunity to share with him. I said, I get it. Man, you know, us church people, we can be stupid sometimes, <laughs> you know, and how we act and how we treat people and stuff like that and how we act with each other. You know, I said, mm -hmm. we're just human beings, and sometimes, doggone it, we have bad hair days. You know, I'm sorry about that. But let me tell you, that, that is so far beyond what we want to look at because when you start looking at people, it's going to get ugly. This is what you need to pay attention to, my friend, this relationship here. Yeah. I don't want to look at people because it distorts how, my, how I view God. It distorts how I want to see God because God's love is so great and he cares for us so much that um, if we allow this to distract us, we can't see this. And I just want to keep my focus on the Lord because that's what it's all about. That's I good. even had the chance on vacation, Pastor Ryan, okay, as we're checking in because I'm a question asker, okay? Yeah. And I'm watching these people, and Pastor has taught us a lot about customer service and junk, all right? So, <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. not junk, but, you know, good <laughs> yeah, stuff, yeah. all right? And, and, and I'm talking to this lady. I'm like, I bet you guys get a lot of – I don't know where I come up with these questions. I yeah. just ask questions, okay? I bet you guys have gotten a lot of training on customer service, because and I bet you've seen a lot, haven't you? She goes, oh, yeah, I could tell you some stories. I said, I get it. I said, you know, I work at a church, and we're trained all the time on customer service, you know, yeah. and meeting the needs of the people and stuff like that. I said, but, man, sometimes when you look at people, I use the same thing that I said with the copier guy. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't look at people. You have to look at God. Yeah. And the, la the lady who was listening, who wasn't really taking care of us, but she was listening. Yeah. Okay? She was listening. She goes, I get it. She says, I've raised in church all my life. And mm. she says, I know what you're talking about. And it is about that relationship with the Lord. And it's like just so wow. random. Yeah. Make the most of every opportunity. It's just That's fun. It. But I'm telling you what, there's probably some here today that are like, I ain't going to ask no questions. <laughs> I don't like talking out loud to people. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, just show me to my room, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> or, yeah. you, know, if you, you know, if you were talking to my Jody, he's not going to start a conversation with somebody like I would. And that's his personality. That's what I mean. Not because he doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to leave that impression. You know, but he's not like a converse. He's not going to start a conversation. It's not his personality. Yeah. So, but just being available, yep. you can look for opportunities. Yeah, what I'm hearing Dorothy say is, is lifestyle evangelism. You know, as you do life, you're looking for a place to connect. You're looking for a place to mention uh, your faith or just love on someone and, and show them kindness. And even yesterday uh, in my neighborhood, or two days ago in my neighborhood, um, 
a, a lady's moving in, and they finished her, her foundation, and my wife and I are walking, so we're present, okay? We're present in our neighborhood, you know, and we walked around the neighborhood, and we run into her, and uh, we said, is this your house? We started the conversation. She said, yeah. She's like, did you just finish the, the foundation? I'm like, wow, this is great. Uh, when are you moving in? She's like, hopefully by December. And um, it led to uh, a conversation about what she does. And, and then she's, so what do you guys do? <laughs> well, let me tell you. Yeah, well, let me tell you. <laughs> so, so that kind of is nice. But I will say, so I said, you know, I'm a pastor at Calvary Church over there on Route 10 near the corner there on, all right, we have, a, we have roof. a big red roof, but now it's blue, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. I had to tell Part her it's, blue. it's yeah. blue right now until it gets fixed. But um, right. it, it, was, uh, it was a cool opportunity. But I thought about even before that, even saying, wow, you must really trust God. Because what she did was she left New York with no job and looked for a job down in Delaware. And she did it without, like, securing a job. And I was going to say, that's some serious trust. You, you remind me of, like, in my life, how I had to trust God, I was going to say that instead of mentioning my job, you know, but she had asked me what I'd do right before I was going to say that. But see, I don't use the pastor card right. all the time because that's too easy for me, right? Well, and then everybody yeah. feels like they, well, sorry, I didn't mean to say it like that. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Oh, I cussed. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. No, and then you know what she went on to say? She's like, I'll have to check you guys out someday nice. when she moves here. So it's, it's little, I was present in the moment, out walking. I struck up a conversation of kindness, just being kind, being a good neighbor, and then I looked for a way to go, you know, how could I uh, see where she is? Right. You know, how can I encourage her? And we encouraged her, and we just said, you know, looking forward to having you in the neighborhood. So what can we do? do? Uh, you heard a lot of examples here, and I'm going to just break some things down. These are on our website, calvarydover.org forward slash grow. I put them all on the website. What can we do to heal and reframe some broken, damaged uh, views, some bridges of the church and the Christian faith. Uh, one of the things I do, number one, is I ask questions and ask for honest feedback. Mm -hmm. And I don't get, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you said that about the church or God. I don't get like that. I don't get easily offended. I let them be real so that they'll, they'll continue to be real and open. By the way, it takes some time for people to do that, too. You know, they have to know that you're, you're not going to be too sensitive and soft about things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at Caesar Adi, when, when students would bring stuff up and it was kind of harsh, I was like, well, I appreciate you sharing with me your view. Well, that just unloaded a bunch of other views because they saw that I wasn't going to attack them back. Okay? So ask for, or ask mm -hmm. questions. You're a good ask, question asker. It could be about anything. When you get into the whole thing about restoring broken views of Christianity, that's when you ask for honest feedback. You did another thing. You listened carefully. Right. You were listening, and you were asking God to give you, third, spiritual discernment. And what I wrote down is have spiritual discernment to hear the core need of their hearts. So you might be out working one day on a job, and you hear some guy talking about, you know, his, his, his marriage or his life, gentlemen, and, and you just, you're listening for the core need. You're not, you're not listening to the surface things. You're, you're asking God to give you discernment on how to connect spiritually. Another thing we do, number four, is we apologize when needed. I noticed you apologized. I apologized mm -hmm. for some, some, some poor, you know, examples right. at times. Not that right. we're perfect. Um, Without throwing the other person under the bus. Yeah, exactly. Not making that other person look bad because to me, yep. there's hurt there too. Exactly. If someone's quick to stay away from the superficial. And that's what I said uh, earlier about the, the mom. She was ra She might have been raised to think that, mm -hmm. so it's not her fault. F fifth is resist the urge to fix them <laughs> right there in that moment. <laughs> that is so my personality, too. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, we're not fixers. We're not we're fixers. Not, we're not the surgeon. We're not the therapist, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, even though I, you know, have a lot of good questions from living with Jody, I'm not a therapist, okay? And we don't have all the answers. So don't treat them like you're a detective and you're asking yeah, all these. Yeah. yeah, you're trying to fix them on the spot or yeah. be their healer in that way because that can be a turnoff too. They may never even thought about those kinds of things. Yeah. And we already said this, the, another point, reframe the misconceptions with truth. There's a, there comes a time where you have to go, well, the Bible doesn't really teach that. And, I, and I'm sorry that that's what, you know, was said. And uh, this, this is what it, the scripture actually means here. 
You know, a lot of confusion comes from poor interpretation of Scripture, right? And a lack of study in the Bible. And so one of the reasons I study the, one of the reasons why I read and study the Bible is, one, to fellowship with God. That's my main thing. I want God to speak to me. I want to connect with him. The second reason is, is to know it well so that I can help other people know God. So it's important that we are able to catch the uh, misconceptions and go, let me, let me share with you what that meant. Uh, keep their need for Jesus at the forefront of your mind. Let me just hang out here for like a, a little bit longer, okay? Their need for Jesus should be at the forefront of our minds the entire time. Not your need to fix them, not your need to address the, the issue on the surface so much. You can use that as a bridge, but the main point is, is to get to the core need of everyone's heart is Jesus. That's right. That's why when Jesus was with the woman at the well, I preached about this a couple weeks ago, her greatest need wasn't water, it was him. She leaves her water pitcher on the side of the well and goes and runs and tells everyone who she found. That tells you right there she was changed in that moment, mm -hmm. right? So here's a few important points. The absence of Jesus is always the greatest concern. Once they have Jesus, they have the potential to change. Let me, let me explain that in this way. I've said this for many years. Without Jesus, there is no heart transformation, just behavior modification. Mm. Say that again, Pastor Ryan. Without Jesus, there is no heart transformation, just behavior modification. What do we do? We, we want them to change their behavior, but they don't know how to change for the long haul or the right. long run because they don't have Jesus in them to change their heart and desires and mind. So our focus isn't to change their behaviors. Good. Our focus is to help them encounter Jesus. Amen? And here's why. There's another great point. It's on the website. No one can live the Christian life without Christ living in them. The living Christ must be living inside of them for you to see that true transformation and change. What do we do? The Bible talks about Christians and believers being sheep and, and, then, and then the um, people who are not like wolves, right? We try to put, we try to take a wolf and, and make them look like a sheep. We try to, you know, disguise them as a sheep because we're just working on the outside issues instead of focusing on the heart and helping them become who they truly are. Or like a child of God versus someone who's not a child of God. So I just want to encourage you to make sure that you focus on Christ in them first. And, and last thought in closing, church, Jesus is with you. He's with you. We have the grace of Jesus to be healing bridges. We have the grace of Jesus going with you to be healing bridges for others. Jesus will give you words to say. He'll give you questions to ask. He'll give you kind gestures and love to show. You have the grace of Jesus in you. Jesus will come out of your life because he lives in you. Man, let us be that church and the, the church of Jesus Christ that really tries to heal some of those broken views and misconceptions of Christianity right now. Because here's the thing, the reason why I'm, we're even talking about this today is there's some things that need to be, there's some misconceptions and some brokenness that needs to be healed and fixed before they can truly walk that bridge of Jesus Christ. And we are the hands and feet of Jesus and we are the light, we are the grace, the salt of the earth, as the Bible says. And so we can help people experience true faith, true Christianity. And the true most important person is Jesus, is Jesus. So I pray that this was encouraging to you. Maybe some of your family and friends need to see this. I know we as a church, we're working hard at making sure that we're representing Christ properly. Amen. And we want, we want your kids, we want your family members, we want your coworkers to encounter Jesus instead of some religious legalism that says you got to do all these things and don't do all these things and then you're right. We cannot live the Christian life without, the, the Christ, without Christ living in us first. Amen? So why don't we stand together and, and pray. And Dorothy, thank you so much. Can we give Dorothy a hand for sharing that? We appreciate that. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we are bridges in your kingdom, that we can build relationships, that we can show the way. 
that we can shine a light to Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we are careful to live gracious, salty, attractive, flavorful lives, God, that represent you properly in our world. May we make the most of every opportunity, as your word says, in these evil days to be wise around those who are outsiders, who are, who are non-Christians, Lord. God, we're not to fix the outward first. We're not to fix anything. We're to represent you and to love people and to share the truth. And you do the fixing, God, on their hearts. Your spirit, Jesus, you do the work and the heart repairs. And you do the healing, Lord. We're just going to represent you. God, may we go and give hope to people who have maybe given up on the church, maybe given up on you or Jesus. May we show a refreshing new light on Christ. God, that we are there and that we don't have it all figured out. We're not mm -hmm. perfect. So, God, may we go today and help be bridges that heal and, and fix those misconceptions in Jesus' name. And, and while we have our heads bowed real quick, because I know we got to go, if you're somebody this morning mm. that has had a misconception about God and or have been hurt in some yes. way and have stayed away from the love of Jesus Christ and all that he has to offer you and all the grace that he wants to pour upon you and the healing he wants to provide for you in, in the way of re, uh, receiving healing from guilt and shame and, and being forgiven of our sins. If you're that person this morning, yes. just pray and ask the Lord right now to um, yes. heal that in Jesus' yes. name. And I pray for Thank you God. that you'd be able to fix your eyes upon God. Thank you. Fix your eyes yes. upon Jesus. Yes. That he went to the cross for you. He yes. died on the cross for you so that you would not have to bear that guilt and shame of sin. Yes. That you would be able to be set free. And the holes that you have in your heart would be yes. filled with his grace and with his mercy. Yes. And if you need help in your growth experience and you have questions about what you've heard today, reach out to us. Yes. On our website, you can reach out to us. Talk to us, email us here at the church. Yes. We love you, and we want to believe that God has got great things for you. Look to him, Amen. not to what's going on around you. Amen. Thank you for your time this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you so much. Be blessed. <laughs>